Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Horizons India Meeting 2019. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here amongst all of you. And I'm looking forward to this very interesting discussion. My personal warm welcome to each one of you for this very interesting topic. Each year in the Horizons Meeting, uh, top leaders from industry and academia get together to brainstorm various topics affecting the world, trade in particular. The topic today is equally or more relevant. Few years back, we would not have even thought about this topic. But with so much uncertainty around us in the world, this is probably the hot topic we have. To set the context, let me say a few facts before we get a chance to be enlightened by this excellent, very knowledgeable panel we are privileged to have. If you look at 2018, the world economic, the geopolitical framework have moved more towards uncertainties than certainties. U.S. China trade tension macroeconomic stress in Argentina, Turkey, South Africa, Indonesia, Brazilian inability to deal with public finance issues, disruption in auto sector in Germany, and financial tightening by almost every major advanced economy. All of that has resulted into a weakened global expansion into 2019. As for IMF, this weakness is still persisting, and as a result, we may end up with a subdued 3.3% growth in the global economy. 2020 onwards, we may see a better, stable 3.5% kind of a growth, but that's majorly coming from emerging economies and their weighting in the global, global uh, scenario. Protectionism is certainly on the rise. All these years we have been talking about the only way to go forward for the world is globalization. But all the things which are happening around us, whether it is UK's decision to exit EU or not exit EU. Uh, many uh, economies are uh, kind of getting away from the trade agreements. The nationalism is the new globalization. That's the new definition of uh, globalization. Over 60 economies have actually taken 7,000 protectionist measurements since the financial crisis. Between U.S. and China, it's the U.S. has levied up to 25% import tariffs on every import from China. And China, in turn, has done the same thing to the U.S. And when we talk about the China, the country which has significantly contributed to the global growth for over 20 years, it's probably at the weakest in the last 30 years of its time. And this is, of course, impacting the global economy. Not to forget the political situation, EU elections, many other countries' uh, elections are coming up, and the most uh, sought after election is the US election in 2020. Everybody is wondering whether Mr. Trump is going to come back or we will have a different U.S. strategy for the world. Last but not the least, climate change. When I was preparing for this trip a couple of weeks back, the Indian capital, Delhi, saw its hottest day ever. It crossed 47 degrees in Delhi. And just when I thought it was enough, last week I read in the paper that Kuwait and part of Pakistan for one of the hottest temperatures on planet Earth, crossing 53 degrees. 1,200 uh, climate change-related laws have been passed uh, recently, but there is still so much to do there. 
this, this economic scenario, political scenario, with climate change, where we are and where we are heading to is probably not a million dollar question, not even a billion dollar question, it's probably a trillion dollar question. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me get my panel, the team panel. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining this panel. We have Ms. Alisa Amico, founder and president of Govan Institute uh, uh, in France. We have Mr. Prakash Hinduja, chairman of Hinduja Group Europe. Mr. Gonzalo Garland, EVP, IE University, uh, here in Spain, and he's the host. Thank you very much for hosting us. Mr. T.V. Narendran, CEO and Managing Director, Tata Steel, and Mr. Murad, Steve Blais, and pardon my accent and pardon my accent. CEO, Integral Petroleum, Switzerland. Uh, and and uh, let's just start uh, as to what their thinking is, and in no particular order, if, my, if I may ask uh, you, Elisa, to start with, uh, to share with us what, what your thinking is. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, um, I got up early in, in Paris to, to join you uh, today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the university for hosting us and um, uh, for Frank, uh, the chairman of Horizons, to for the kind invitation to, uh, to speak once again at uh, one of your meetings. Um, I'd like to start off by making echoing some of the comments you were making uh, on global instability and, and um, speaking on some governance trends, both at the level of um, states, but also the level of corporates and uh, making some um, links between the two. I think that clearly from, from, um, from a global, global perspective, political or, or economic perspective, uh, our current uh, governance system is marred by instability. Uh, obviously, the conflict between uh, or the ongoing discussions between uh, U.S. and China, the uh, U.S.-Iran issues and, and others that will um, have a concrete impact on international trade and investment flows. Um, um, obviously, the tensions between between India and Pakistan, in particular, are, provide uh, further context and food for thought. I think what's interesting is, is, is not necessarily only the sort of the tensions that we see between nation states, but also the tensions that are emerging in the international uh, architecture. So um, I think that increasingly the relationship between international organizations, whether we think about World Bank, IMF, OECD is one where there are uh, differences in terms of school of thought uh, and alternative models increasingly emerging uh, around the world. So with the, uh, with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, uh, alternative institutions are being put, put forth uh, as, as um, alternative models to, to thinking and to providing finance um, uh, in, emerging, in emerging markets. Um, and with, the, uh, with Saudi Arabia taking the reins of uh, G20 from Japan, I think that would also provide further impetus, um, perhaps shifting away from conventional thinking in terms of um, um, international standard setting bodies uh, and principles that would be put forth in, in the coming years. Um, I think at the same time, from my perspective, I think there are some question marks in terms of Kind of the positioning of emerging markets in this in, in the in the this next few years going forward, um, and particular question marks around the golden days of, of emerging markets and their attractiveness and invest, as investment destination, which is ultimately um, the key the key question to ask. Um, we've seen a decline in in, in, in economic flows uh, around the world, in, in particular in, in foreign direct investment, but also in portfolio investment. I'll, I will mention that. Um, FDI globally has dropped um, about uh, 27% uh, to, to account uh, for 1.3% of global GDP last year, which is the lowest, um, uh, the lowest point since 99. Um, um, however, we've seen at the same time, looking at FDI, some positive, uh, positive developments in terms of FDI specifically to, to emerging markets where there's still greater flows to uh, the BRICS minus, of course, Brazil because um, Brazil has not been performing as we all know um, very well. But ultimately, I think there are also question marks around this hegemony of the BRIC countries that we are so used to, to hearing about in terms of their um, prevalence in the global economy and the, and the role in the global economy, both from an FDI but also from a portfolio investment uh, point of view. Because if we look at uh, public equity markets, and, and they'll work quite a lot with uh, stock exchanges, with securities regulators, uh, and with investors, uh, the activity in, in public equity markets in, in recent years have also been uh, subdued 
um, in terms of global issuance uh, of new new equities. So um, the the issuance um, of, of stocks uh, around the world has basically half, despite initiatives uh, like the job Act in the U.S. Uh, and other initiatives in the U.K. Um, and it, what's happening, I think, which, which is also interesting to, to follow, is that international investors, the largest uh, institutional investors, whether, whether you look at uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, or others, are increasingly shifting assets to, um, to, private, uh, to, uh, to private equity. Um, and just to give you some, some figures to highlight that, um, a recent um, survey by BlackRock, which is the b- biggest asset manager uh, worldwide, highlighted that in their survey of 230 institutional clients, more than um, representing more than seven trillion dollars of investable assets, over half intended to increase decrease their allocation to, uh, to public equities, increase their allocation to um, to uh, uh, to private uh, to private uh, asset classes. And at the same time, I think also um, thinking about shifting of monetary flows in the global system, what's interesting to think about is the the shift or the, the emergence of debt as an increasingly, um, increasingly growing uh, asset class and an also an increasingly growing risk to the global economy. So, um, again, just to put out some numbers to, to perhaps frame this conversation, you can dive in further in, in the discussion. Uh, global debt has reached uh, essentially an all-time high of 225% of, of GDP in 2017, which equates to about $86,000 of, um, of debt per capita, so um, quite a hefty number. Um, if, if we look at India specifically, um, India has about 126% of debt to, to GDP ratio, but more uh, le- less um, less um, uh, important private debt than, uh, than other markets. So I think a lot of food for thought in terms of um, governance of the overall architecture and, and, the, and the difference the, the differences in terms of um, where capital is flowing and that how that will be um, affecting the, the, the global financial system going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth, if I may request you to share your views. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Bunsen. Uh, I've been uh, very happy that today KPMG has been the key moderator for us for this conference, and uh, for Horace's India conference that will be our visit today is the opening of the session over here. I would like to take them to give us the opportunity to give my review on the world economy, what's going on, input for the global economy, where we are, and what are we doing, right, where we are going. Well, the global economy activity has slowed down notably in the second half of last year. After strong growth in early 2017 and 2018 due to the variety of factors affecting the major economies, the trade war between China and U.S. has negatively affected the business investment confidence and the trade flows across the world, which is deepening a global economic slowdown that was already underway. According to forecasts, the global economy has slowed down in its lowest phase in three years and is subject to the substantial risk. World Bank forecast the global growth of this year is now 2.6%. Global trade growth has slowed down to its lowest level since 2008. Financial crisis due to unexpected weakness in trade and manufacturing across the advanced to developing economies export from Europe and Japan slowed down particularly to China. World Bank has noted that uncertainty, including the trade tensions, have been affected by slowly global investment and weakening confidence. It warned that the risk is outlook firmly on the downside, in part reflecting the possibility of destabilizing policy development, including a further escalation trade tensions between the major economies. IMF has estimated that tariffs added this year will subtract 0.3% of the global GDP in 2020. Manufacturing being substantially vulnerable in trade is flowing in advanced economies and the factory index dropped to its lowest reading of the Trump presidency in May. Trade policies were not only a reason behind the slowing production continuing 
structural slowdown with China's growth and tension from the UK Brexit and from the EU or among the factors. While step by step opening the China's market offers unprecedented opportunities for our global banking, financial firms, Chinese economy has slowed down. In fact, 2018, China posted its weakest economic growth in 28 years, partly due to the lack of structural reform and combination of the factors, including the failure to raise shadow banking, increasing the trade tension with USA. China is expected to slow down further in 2019. Therefore, trade tensions have disrupted growth, with uncertainty high and confidence low investment has suffered, and the manufacturing sector has taken hit. Europe has adversely affected as 70% of its exports were linked to the global supply chain to the trade dispute so that the European economy lost more than expected and business evidence weakened. Germany showed how the trade war between US and China could split. Even its car industry, which is the backbone of its economy, was disrupted by the introduction of the new emission standard as well as the independency on China's growth as the trade tension escalated. China's economy weakening manufacturing in Germany paid the price. German experts commented that there has been a biggest decline in auto market in 20 years. There was a danger of global auto crisis. Uncertainty was dealing with willingness leading and the growth of the Eurozone. World Bank Group President Mr. Kevin Malpass had stated that it was urgent that the countries make significant structural reforms and improve the business climate and attract investment. We also need to make debt management and transparency high priority so that the new debt adds to the growth investment. Mario Draghi, the European Central Bank President, and Christine Lagarde, IMF, the President and Managing Director, have warned that the global trade dispute between US and China, as well as threat and dispute with Europe and other industrial nations, caused headwinds could get worse. In fact, the some countries have already been affected. To Australia, Turkey, and South Africa. Therefore, the situation today is long. Period of higher tariffs, India, US, and China, new trade barriers between US and EU has sharply, sharply slowed down long for Europe and financial vulnerable in high tech. The need of the power is that the government must intensify international dialogue between confidence and invest in to prepare the challenge and the skill depth of, of the digital plan. Hinduja Group companies, after having all these problems worldwide, we have been successfully going ahead with all the issues which the world is going through. Through our great experience of 100 years of in 40 countries, and we have 150,000 people employed in our organization. Prime Minister Modi on June 14 stated that SCO that we need a rule-based, transparent and different military, open and inclusive multilateral trading system focused on the World Trade Organization. However, WTO has rendered in fact due to some also the multilateral. Let us hope that the US-China meet on the sideline of the G20 summit in Japan in the coming days and could offer a ray of hope of assuming that the trade tension between the two countries, which has adversely affected the global economy. 2020, we hope that this year will be a very difficult year for the world. So we have to focus on to see that how conservative investments and opportunities can be given to the world. And Africa will be the great opportunity, and we have to focus on it to see that the growth in Asia and Africa and the G20 meeting which is taking place in Japan will be a focus to the world to see whether U.S. what role they are playing with, with China. I'd like to thank you very much and I hope that we all will be able to focus on the world economy very quickly. Thank you. You are scaring me, so you are know, talking about the entrepreneurs like you are talking about conservative investment that worries me really. Mm -hmm. uh, but over to you, Mr. Garland, to talk about uh, what your view, how you look at it from. So, thank you very much.
first of all, let me welcome you to Hawaii. We're very happy to be co-hosting this event together in the Southeast India uh, meeting. Um, well, I'm here more like a uh, professor of economics, so I teach macroeconomics, so I guess that's the reason why I'm here. So the topic here is about where are we and where are we going, and I might add a, a small question for a couple of minutes, and it's where are we coming from? I think that the whole perspective helps us to understand better uh, some of the things that are happening in the world. So let me just very briefly go to, uh, being an economist, I also always tell my students that economists were much better historians than what we are anticipating in the future, so I respect economic history a lot. So there's a famous economic historian, Angus Madison, and there's a group called the Groningen Group at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and they have these fantastic graphs where they have estimated what percentage of the total of the GDP of the world was accounted by different regions. If you look at history all the way up to the 1800s, China and India by themselves explain approximately between 50 and 60 percent of the GDP of the world. So sometimes when I show these graphs to my students, I tell them, so we'll hear about China and India being emerging countries, but maybe we should say re-emerging, because they really were a very significant part of the GDP of the world for many, many centuries. Then, of course, things, I mean, there were lots of changes starting with the Industrial Revolution. Then when you, when you see the significant increase of per capita income in the North America and Western Europe, and this just continues to create a gap that the scale of China and India decreased significantly. And we get to a number of decades, which are between 1960 and 1990, where basically that's what I call under the G7 time. At that time, the seven largest economies in the world, plus the Soviet Union, were accounted between 80 and 85 percent of the GDP of the world. And 85 percent of the GDP of the population of the world, including all of Latin America, all of Africa, India, most of Asia, accounted for 15, 20 percent of the GDP of the world. And that was the world for 200 years. And suddenly the world starts changing. First one was Japan, catching up after the Second World War, then you had Nation Tiger, Nick, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. South Korea, they have China reforming in the 1980s, and then come the 90s. And I always tell my students, you don't realize how important the 90s were. There were so many things happening in the 90s. And they were not completely unrelated. India, for one, starts to reform, changing the whole model of the permit rush, the whole import substitution to an opening of the economy. That was, that was not the only thing. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, Latin America opens the rest of the world by opening its borders, free trade, etc. So, the world seems to manage it. We're a completely different world from what it is. There's lots of graphs and maps are showing. Today, the emergence of China, the emergence of India, it's a much more complicated world. And now what we're seeing those tensions are right from that. But this is a phenomenal time in terms of the extension of per capita income increasing all over the world. Just a couple of data, the latest data that the World Bank has published in 2017. We still have to wait for the 2018 official data which has to be cleaned by the World Bank. India, for example, became the sixth largest economy in the world, so that's in France for the first time in history. And that was from the standard measurement. You probably know this from the third measurement, which is a purchasing power parity. So if you apply the price of the United States to the Indian economy, India is already the third economy in the world, right after China, number one, and the United States, number two, India is the third largest economy in the world. And these are just, these are two examples of a whole phenomena of really moving into a much more complex world, and that's where we're living, and that thing is clearly irreversible. It's irreversible, the world is a lot more complex, there's a lot more players. And for example, if you come back to that, I see, in fact, sometimes we talk about the frame of India to have a, a permanent seat in the, in the Security Council of the United Nations, it makes all sense. And eventually, unless, I would say, that has to happen sometimes, sometimes too. So I'm going to end with the introduction, just very briefly going back to some of the issues that have been mentioned. So where are we now? Where are we going? I think it's clear. The trends are clear. There might be bumps in the road, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but I see a very clear irreversible road on these much more important than India, the Chinese in general. Some people say from the west to the rest. Some people used to say from the west to the east. I agree more with from the west to the rest. But right now we are seeing a lot of uncertainties, as you mentioned before. And I would just add, because we know what those uncertainties are, clearly trade war, which is very dangerous. Economies were very much against what this can produce, because we think if there are two big contributors to worldwide progress, they have been technological change and trade. 
and therefore if we go against one of those pillars, the effects might be widespread and very negative worldwide. And the only point I want to add in there is the IMF, as we was mentioned before, was already talking about this in 2017, right after Brexit and the elections of the United States. And what they were saying was, Microeconomically, we are in the best position in 2017 since we've been since 2007. And their advice was always let's avoid self inflicted wounds. And that's where we are now. And when they mentioned self inflicted wounds, they were very clear. They were not, they were saying, well, let's be careful with these trade conflicts. Let's hope that the scenario that we'll be assuming is they will get it, they will agree on something and these will be solved somehow. And Brexit, it will be an orderly. Union of the European Union, starting, as you were saying before, the second half of 2018, became clear for the IMF to start saying, unfortunately, we cannot continue to do this. The situation is much worse. Our forecast changed, and basically, what we're seeing is a very strong slowdown of many places of the world, not, not saying everywhere in the world. So, there's a lot of short term uncertainty, and I will agree more that it would be fantastic for some solutions to this in the G20 meeting. Unfortunately, I'm not too optimistic about that. That's what I want to say with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, India will probably surpass UK also in 2019. Uh, but thanks for, uh, we needed some optimism as far as future is concerned. Uh, if I can ask you this uh, You know, I think of a bit where uh, Mr. Allen uh, left off. You know, if you look at it fundamentally, I don't think things uh, have been as good as we've seen in the last few years. If you look at it from a macroeconomic point of view, in 2008, everyone said the world was going to end, but I think the Asian economy is led by China, uh, tried to spend its way out of the trouble, and largely the world uh, rebalanced. I think Europe is still struggling, but the rest of the world picked up and uh, moved on. Uh, in 2015 16, there was a concern about what's happening in China, which had a set of uh, consequent uh, impact on multiple industries uh, across the world. But China, every time we think that China is going down, they bounce back again. And since then, things have not been as bad in China. In fact, a $12 trillion economy growing at 6, 6.5%, you know, uh, it's adding in India every four years. You know, so that's the size of growth, if you look at it. So China at 6% growth today is as good as China at 10% growth five years back or 10 years back in, in the amount of economic activity uh, that it's adding. So in some sense, uh, the concerns today are self-inflicted, as uh, Mr. Darwin said. Uh, I think two big issues which uh, seem to be uh, derailing the good news is uh, trade actions being taken by different governments and the geopolitical environment. But if you really look back at why is it uh, that where uh, we are where we are, I think it boils down to the fact that vast sections of populations in countries feel that the system does not work for them. Right? So if you look at it over the last 15, 20, 30 years, uh, communism as an option has uh, died out. Capitalism was seen as an option which after 2008 there's a little bit more uh, uh, recalibration going on on what really is capitalism and how good is it in the form that it was in. And uh, there is a big section of the population which feels that the system does not work for them. So while the inequalities between countries seem to have reduced, while vast uh, numbers of people have moved out of poverty, I'm told 50% of the population lived on less than $2 a day 50 years back and now it's less than 10%. Of course, most of it is because of what's happened in China. So it seems to be that there is a lot of development, a lot of people moving out of poverty. But I think people have just about moved out of poverty and they're stuck in the middle. And even in the rich world, there are a lot of people stuck in the middle where they've not seen much uh, wage growth. And hence, uh, there is a feeling that the system does not work for them, uh, which is getting manifested in uh, choices which surprise the urban uh, educated uh, elite. So there is a bit of a disconnect if you see the U.S., uh, what East Coast and West Coast U.S. thinks is very different from what Middle America thinks. If you see what happened in the U.K. on Brexit, London thought one way, the rest of the U.K. thought the other way. And uh, even in India, uh, I think there is a feeling that the urban India is a bit disconnected from what in India is called Bharat, which is uh, the rest of India. So, so there is this uh, thing happening, and which is really manifesting itself into uh, uh, you know leadership across the world which is largely being asked to first take care of the interests of the country. And that's what they're doing. And uh, so that is one thing which is happening. So one needs to really think about how can we have more inclusive growth. So while we've had good growth over the last few decades, how can we have more inclusive growth? How can we reduce inequality in the system? And how can we bring back the confidence that the system works for more people than just a fraction uh, uh, at the top? 
The second thing which I think is uh, causing a lot of concern is uh, technology. You know, any, every time there's something very big and new in technology, there's always concern. 30, 40 years back, it was uh, computers and what would it do to jobs. Uh, then you had industrial robots and what it did to jobs in manufacturing. In fact, a lot of what I described about uh, the middle uh, staying where they are while the, uh, you know, while a lot of the poor came into the middle and a lot of the rich got richer is also because in manufacturing across the world, globalization made sure that there was a gravitation towards uh, lower wage cost countries. There was a replacement of human labor with uh, uh, industrial robots, which started getting cheaper and cheaper. Unions got weaker. And now what we're seeing is with analytics and artificial intelligence and things like that. A lot of the brain work is also uh, has the potential to get outsourced. Earlier it was a physical work which was getting outsourced to machines. And now a lot of the brain work is also potentially uh, can be outsourced to uh, uh, machines. And that's again causing a lot of concern. So instead of people who never thought that the job would be under threat are suddenly thinking that maybe my job is also under threat and that also breeds a lot of negativity and anxiety. So to me, technology and inequality are two big aspects. Technology can also be a huge opportunity. I think technology can solve many of the social issues that there are. Technology can empower people. Technology can address inclusion because even in India we've seen that uh, the financial inclusion is growing by leaps and bounds with the Aadhaar card, which is a biometric card, which is there. Uh, large numbers of people are getting the benefits of direct, uh, the direct benefits and direct transfers into the bank accounts. Large numbers of people who never had a bank account have bank accounts now. So technology can also be used as a lever to address uh, some of these issues. But I think you cannot disconnect the economic uh, story from the uh, political story and the societal story. And I think as leaders, one needs to look at uh, uh, it in a more holistic way than just look at it purely from like, the central bank going to cut interest rates and is that going to translate into more economic growth. Because frankly, if you look at it, inflation is low, central banks have the room to cut in interest rates. Most countries uh, uh, are doing okay from an economic growth point of view, apart from maybe Europe. And, uh, you know, so I think uh, things have not been as benign many times in the past, but I think the issues are beyond just pure economic factors. Yeah, interesting. And, and your point on uh, China is still growing at 6% is a very valid point. That is a large economy at 6%. That's not that bad. Uh, well, what would you like to hear your views on and I'm very happy to be here to be the medical center and this program of research. And special thanks to Dr. Frank Lister. I'm talking to Dr. Kennedy for this work. A great organization of this event, and it's really in the place of the full history when we're dealing here. And my name is Murat Kirkipesta. I am the Managing Director of Integral Petroleum. It's an oil trading company. It's also a crude oil petroleum product. It's a chemical petroleum from the Caspian region to the world market. Also, I am the Chairman of the Organizing Committee of the Caspian Week in Davos, which is a forum dedicated to promote and develop the greater Caspian region. Like I can explain it from the interested, but I think some of you already have been to that forum. Uh, now back to the business. I would like to highlight some ideas. Uh, and uh, first of all, let's start the way we are now. And we are living in a very interesting time and uh, in very interesting world, actually. Because the traditional superpowers, they are losing their influence uh, for various reasons. It will start from the United States. In my view, it's a rather voluntaristic, voluntaristic approach to the foreign policy. If we are talking about Russia, uh, we see that I think the problem is the minor micromanagement of the economy, which is leading sometimes to quite wrong decisions. And the uh, relations uh, between the big and the superpowers and big countries in the world are not, are not good. Uh, we can talk about uh, United States China relations, we can talk about other issues. Uh, what we see also, the European Union really, I think, almost stands in their own internal and external problems and uh, uh, cannot now present to the world something significantly important. Uh, and what we see that, uh, from my point of view, China started to win against the geopolitical competition. Uh, and uh, we see this on the geopolitical level. Uh, for example, let's take this Belt and Road Initiative from the Citizen Team which I think will change the world for the, during the next decade. Uh, 
and uh, also economy is going well despite a lot of uh, forecasts that will go down. It's, it's, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost never going down and so it's somehow recovering and going well. I was in China recently and I saw myself and I think maybe one of the secrets is that uh, China, like uh, all one, uh, one and a half billion Chinese people, they are moving like uh, one company, like one union. Uh, and at the same time, and I think this, uh, this came maybe from the idea of the government reclaimed economy, which came from the Soviet Union time. And China trying to uh, implement this idea into practice with the, a lot of adjustments, of course. And every year, a lot of new things happen in China on the government uh, level, which practice are changing. But the idea is the same. Uh, China is like one unit going ahead. Uh, meanwhile, in the other countries, there are a lot of internal tensions, external tensions, they uh, interfere with each other, and then the results are not so good. And, uh, but uh, we never saw in the history that uh, the idea of the government reclaimed economy on the extra long term horizon went and worked well. That's why we'll let's see what will happen. And uh, now, what should we do in such situation? And I will take uh, two countries. Uh, one is India, because we are here on the process in the event. And I will try to formulate my ideas what uh, should be done in India uh, in order to use the unique opportunities when superpowers are going down. And I think, first of all, India uh, is almost 1.4 billion people living there. Uh, the great talent, especially on the IT industry side. IT technologies and mathematics and so on, and India should use this uh, opportunity and uh, move and get support on the government level, full support, the development of the uh, digital technologies, information technology and related, uh, related industries. And uh, not only on the private company level, it should be some kind of very strong government program and where government of India should support, despite not very easy economic situation, this movement. Because this, is po po uh, this could be possibly uh, the way how to win this competition or at least to be more competitive. And it also in India, there are a lot of things uh, to be optimized. Uh, I was in India, I saw myself. Uh, really, a lot of things could be done, could be improved. There are a lot of hidden reserves in each uh, part of the human life. Uh, and uh, also, India should uh, work, about, uh, work on the ecological issues. And I think the easiest thing here is just to move from the coal consumption to produce an energy to natural gas, LNG or pipeline gas. Uh, because, and also uh, to develop renewable energy. Uh, but natural gas is more important because all possibilities are there already, just to switch. And uh, ecological problems in India, they are not only important for India, they are important for the whole world. And uh, more and more time will go, more important for the whole world, for, for the whole world is also to help India to, 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 to solve these issues. Uh, and also, now let's uh, talk about Switzerland. Why Switzerland? Because I'm living and working in Switzerland for more than 10 years. And I see how Swiss government is using these opportunities. Uh, for example, end of, in, at the end of April, uh, the World State visit of the President of Switzerland to China, to Belt and Road Forum. And at uh, this time, a quite unique memorandum of the strategic cooperation for business and the third countries in the frame of the Belt and the Belt and Road Initiative. It means that Switzerland, by this, uh, attracting business related to China for the third countries, like Spain and the Middle East. So sometimes, uh, big countries, it's not very easy for them uh, to go and do some business uh, because uh, so people could be just sometimes afraid. Uh, people, some countries, they don't want, let's say, big countries' influence to be increased uh, in, in their homeland. That's why here, Switzerland could be like a uh, uh, facilitator to do this business. And uh, uh, Switzerland is trying to do this. And I think uh, this is a good sign that a uh, small country could take really important role uh, in this uh, huge, uh, in this huge uh, long term project like Belt and Road in for example, and others. Uh, and uh, now also, I would like to talk a little bit uh, how. What are the critical enablers like to the program for the economic growth uh, in the world during the next decade? I would rather tell next 10, 20, or 30 years. This is a little bit more long term. Uh, and I think here also 
Uh, there are a lot of things uh, in this business that is already existing in the world, but uh, not enough of time. And now with the new digital moment, the new digital technologies, there are a lot of possibilities to make this optimization. And uh, from uh, very simple things, you can get really great economic effects. Let's start from the road traffic. Sometimes uh, some cities are crazy. Even I'm living in Geneva. Even in Geneva, there's a very small, almost village, a very small city. We are having the traffic, uh, traffic jams and so on. Just because of uh, in the, uh, not optimized uh, system of the traffic signals, traffic lights. And uh, I think uh, in the, uh, the world and in each uh, business and each country, uh, who will go that way, it means digitalization and trend optimization, will start winning the competition. Who will ignore that movement, uh, will save the traditional uh, technologies, uh, sooner or later will, so, so no later, so no later will be okay. Also, what we see now, uh, that uh, traditional banking industry, uh, I think, soon or very soon will disappear because uh, uh, traditional banks they lost their connection with the real business. There is no any more bridge between the money, between the capital, and between the real business. Uh, and now uh, this uh, cannot be in the vacuum. That's why a lot of people are trying to do it on the alternative way, like tip to peer finance and even crowdfunding. And they're trying to replace uh, funds, uh, even now in my business, in the commodity trading, now there are plenty of commodity trade finance funds. Before they were not exist at all. Now it's more than the bank. And uh, uh, I think that uh, this will be the movement that, uh, because banks now over-regulated and they're afraid to do any business, uh, they count on any possible, even theoretical, hypothetical risk. That's why they are rejecting a lot of transactions. And uh, businessmen, uh, they have no possibility to get finance from the bank. They will get financing, but from, from the alternative sources. And uh, this also is closely related to the digital technologies, because all these digital finance crowdfunding platforms uh, could use blockchain, could use artificial intelligence, and uh, all these new developments. Uh, competition uh, becoming more and more tough, more and more difficult to do business. And, uh, that's why we need to really find all possible hidden reserves. Uh, we need to, to implement all possible new technologies in our businesses to, just to be competitive, just to survive. And uh, uh, let's say in our business, uh, we uh, didn't exercise. We have 50 vessels on the operation, our, our management, working between the captain and the boxes. And uh, before these uh, vessels uh, were managed by the operators, so called uh, guys who were sitting near the computer and the mouse moving the mouse off on the screen, what to do, what to do, and so on. And uh, uh, two years ago, we started to think, okay, uh, there are a lot of mistakes which uh, human operators could do. And uh, uh, one operator cannot control more than 10 vessels. Uh, that's why, in order to control this vessel, we need to get five operators. And five operators, they are losing the global picture, they are starting to interfere with each other. And at the end, uh, all 50 vessels is, is not doing well. That's why we uh, found the team of mathematicians, the scientists, they did for us optimization algorithm, it cost us $300,000 only and 18 months of time. And now our vessel is being managed by the computer, by artificial intelligence. And the economic effect only for our company could be up to $10 million per annum from this 50 vessel. And this is just a simple example of how is a small business, a regional business, a regional oil trading company, we can get really a huge effect and increase our competitive competitive uh, because of this optimization. And uh, now we are coming uh, to other idea uh, that uh, very soon, uh, because now you know that uh, there are a lot of movements to put everywhere with uh, and uh, sensors and so on or, or to control everything, to collect online information about the cargo movement. Uh, now we are also in, uh, introducing this system into our container business. And uh, very soon it will be so much information available from various sensors, chips and so on, machine parts and so on, that uh, it, will, uh, it will not be enough to put in computing power to process this information and analyze. And I think uh, the problem which will come in the several years from now will be a lack of computing power to analyze this data. And uh, I think also uh, there are a lot of resources going on with the quantum computing and so on. 
Uh, but uh, uh, I think this could be one of the problems in the five or ten years for the government. That uh, it would be so much data available that uh, it would be very difficult to get proper analysis on the interpretation of this data. And, uh, uh, but generally, uh, well, today's time is good because there are a lot of challenges. And uh, for the challenges, we need to be ready to do actions, we need to do replies. And uh, that's why we need to innovate, we need to invent something new. And, uh, and there are a lot of possibilities just to do this. And I'm very positive that everything will go well. And the uh, and, and whole economy will really grow. I just need to do a certain thing. This is just my idea. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. I love your comment on uh, India's talent and how potentially we can use it. Uh, I'm conscious of time, but uh, and I really want to open it up for the forum. But let me ask a quick question and maybe half a minute kind of a response uh, from uh, each one of you. And let me start with uh, you, with Ms. Ms. Amico. Uh, if, if you were to suggest two or three things to the global economy to come together, what, what would you suggest so that we are not talking uh, for the world? I mean, you talked about uh, FBI going down. It's, it's not helping anybody, so might as well come together. So, what are those two, three things you would suggest? Uh, it's a very good question. It's hard to, to give a succinct answer to. Um, I think that um, one of the things that we're seeing now is, is kind of an encroachment or uh, or a great dialogue between or overlap between. Uh, uh, between um, uh, public governments and, and corporate governments. So the idea, and, and there's a couple of uh, comments that were raised in the panel in terms of inequality. I mean, if, if you look at one of the sort of Thomas Piketty, who writes, uh, who everyone knows these days, has become probably more famous than Elton John or, or some of the Bollywood household names. So I think the key, the key focus point globally today is in inequality. And the truth is that I think in the policy circles there are very few ideas as to what can really be done in terms of as, as a talking point um, to address it because the possibility or the, the maneuver for government to introduce additional taxes all over the world has really win. And so what I think is happening, and it's from my perspective an interesting trend to, to follow, is kind of encroachment of public policy into the corporate uh, domain. So what we see, for instance, um, uh, in Europe, it, it's this, uh, for example, the enlargement of um, the mandate of corporations towards, from financial to more um, social uh, metrics with the expansion of the, of the purpose of the corporation in France and in the UK and other places. Uh, Theresa May's government introducing employees on board and how that will play out. Um, quotas for diversity on board. So I think that Essentially, what we're seeing is, is, a, is a movement to address inequality directly through the corporate boardrooms and also uh, through institutional investors. And, and to me, this is kind of an interesting area to observe going forward in terms of the choke point being, obviously, economic inequality and what governments are doing to address it is, is slightly different than what I think it used to be a decade ago. Thank you. Thank in, you. In, in a short. Yeah. <laughs> I can see already a lot of things uh, going up, but I still want to ask two quick questions and one to you, Mr. Uh China has been playing this critical role in the last uh, 20 plus years in global uh, growth. Uh, if India has to play that role in the next 10 to 20 years, what would you suggest to the government of India to do in the next decade or so? Well, I would suggest that uh, they should uh, bring in more manufacturing uh, programs and the new reforms should be bring in so that the opportunity for the new technology coming into the country can attract more and more investment in the country and the agriculture aspect of it, which is a very important aspect in India, where a new incentives can be given to the microeconomic plan and plus the sector of the banking sector and the insurance sector. The reforms is be brought in very rapidly. And as in, uh, India is uh, economically is growing and has grown in the last four years, Prime Minister Modi has uh, been re-elected again. This last uh, another four or five years of his on, on the scale, he should uh, try to use the help of the people, uh, groups like KPMG, Brightwater House, all the big names 
who are experts and can advise him by using the different different things in the field of infrastructure, for example. Infrastructure India has a great opportunity, more than I think two to three trillion dollars uh, economic and boom in India for the near future. And I'm confident that uh, with uh, the new plans which Prime Minister Modi has planned to do it, it will come up and the Americans and the Europeans will go a long way for India to invest because China they have seen their things, they have done. And the next country is the India for the future. So I would advise the, all the government of the world that they should look India very closely and try to see that how the opportunities can help and moreover they can help the African world also because India has been very close to the Africa since last hundred years and uh, we have a huge Indian community with who are all around the world. We are looking India very closely for the plan of the industry development. This is what I think. Thank you, thank you, sir. So now I can open it up uh, for the uh, Mr. Kodar. Sir, uh, my request is just keep the question. I have only about seven, eight minutes, and I would like three or four questions to be taken. What would be the most your advice that the current escalation between the US and India will be We have started by imposing the duty, extra duty on the Indian goods, on the, again, the India has imposed the duty on the second part about the drug crisis which is emerging very fast, then what will be the effect of the oil structure, which are mostly dependent on India, on the oil, that is the economy of the oil. No doubt about that. Currency is very stable despite of all the hiccups. But uh, these two things may not escalate even past the uh, India-Pakistan conflict. That may not have have any impact on the Indian economy, but these two factors may have the impact on the Indian economy. Who, who do you want uh, to answer that question? Anybody? Uh, who would like to take that question? Okay. Uh, so I think, uh, as far as the India US three issues are concerned, I think just now there's a little bit more posturing going on. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, it's so material that they're going to uh, fight with each other for it. I think uh, they'll find a solution. I think I'm hopeful about that. Uh, and the second point that you made on the oil price for the is very important because one thing which we not given enough uh, rating for is the fact that low oil prices have really helped India in the last few years. And, uh, you know, so to me, we can't afford a high oil price kind of situation at this point in time because the government asset is focused on getting the economic activity uh, started again in India. And the last thing they would want is uh, high oil prices and pressure on inflation. Yeah, please. And uh, during the last two and a half years, the uh, oil prices does not, they do not depend on the economical factor. They are not so dependent that sometimes a lot, even on the prices, it's like what is happening now. Uh, because uh, in, uh, in the world, there is an extra uh, possibility to supply oil. And even what is happening with Iran, because of sanctions, they are almost decreased uh, by the uh, supply export. And it, it, it did not affect the total oil prices when oil prices went down. Because Saudi Arabia increased, Russia increased, and other countries increased. That's why I'm not so pessimistic that even if there will be uh, some other complications in the Gulf, the oil prices will really go high on the long term perspective. Of on the short term, yes. But in the long term, there are possibilities to push them down again. Yeah, so, we got some trade. I think it's interesting to see how, I mean, the Trump administration started talking about issues with Mexico and Canada, then they were renegotiated, things, uh, things seem to calm down, then he confronts China, that's probably the most serious. But at one point, I mean, he's also, he goes, I mean, the, the coast tariff came to India and goes against the, you know, takes the preference of access, he's threatening Europe, so it's really very global. So in that sense, I think it's, it's very complex because it's not easy to say, well, India maybe will become an ally with the U.S. because they have the priority with China. The whole trade issue is, I think, I agree there, I don't think it's going to escalate, but 
we see you in coming in the world. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm Raja Sanurya, and uh, we have a cross-border investment platform between India and Europe. Uh, we have an office in, in Geneva as well. Uh, now, we believe that technology is going to change things at scale uh, in a country like India. A lot of the places where physical infrastructure cannot exist, technology is going to change things. Now, the issue is how do we achieve technology at scale? So, the two questions are, is it going to be private, who's going to lead it, or the government? And second question is, is it going to be large corporates or MSME? You want anybody for the government? I'm going to let you know if you could address. Yeah. So, uh, to me, I think technology is a great opportunity. And uh, if you really look at the IT sector, we keep talking about the IT sector which grew in India. It grew because there was a strong telecommunications uh, infrastructure in place. You know, the rest of manufacturing exports, etc., struggled in India because we are still struggling with infrastructure and the cost of getting the goods to the ports and getting it out of the ports and so on and so forth uh, adds to the cost by the time it reaches the customer. Right? So, to me, technology can be a great uh, opportunity for us. It can be driven by both private. The government has created some fantastic platforms, whether it's the uh, biometric Aadhaar card, whether it's the UPI. There are so many things that the government has created, and there's a huge amount of data which is now available, which can be leveraged without compromising on uh, privacy issues. So now, I think there is a great opportunity, and India has a lot of entrepreneurial spirit, which has been demonstrated across industries. So if you marry the entrepreneurial spirit of India, if you marry the IT uh, backbone, which is already there, if you marry that with the manufacturing potential that is there, you can actually leapfrog past many of the uh, you know, we talk of Industry 4.0, so India can actually jump straight into that category uh, by doing all this. And uh, the physical infrastructure is also important. I don't think we should underestimate the impact of rural electrification over the last five years and what that has done to the overall thing. Uh, the government is talking of five quarters to all. That's going to be a huge thing, housing for all. So some of these roads, rural roads, a lot has been spent. All that will help bring uh, inclusion into uh, rural economies, and rural economy India has always been a consumption-led growth, so uh, the health of the rural economy is also very important for India. So, I have something to say. Yeah, just, just like to, to add a perspective on that. I think that uh, the story of technology is also more of a conceptual story, so what we're seeing, I think, is the, is the uh, emergence of potentially competing uh, business model when it comes to technology, because if you look at the number of registrations or patents, or if you look at the number of unicorns, for example, I mean, there are two plants and the unicorn population is dominated by it. It's essentially today, U.S. and China, and those represent two very different uh, universes of, of doing business from a, from a form of capitalism point of view. And so I think there's, there's to my mind, there's, there's a, the, the population of state enterprises and everything that the, the Chinese government is, is fostering in order to, to create uh, IT uh, investment. And then there's sort of the very different U.S.-based model and the tension between the two that we see even in the political discourse in terms of the Trump administration saying that, you know, we do not want uh, um, to control the Chinese students in the U.S. Uh, education system or not. So I think that there is a... Um, there are first two different schools of thought, and I think secondly, there's also an interesting scope for public policy, because if you look at um, one of the interesting announcements, and I wrote a piece uh, on this uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, was uh, at Davos, the, the artificial intelligence framework that was announced by the government of Singapore to regulate all the AI technologies. And that was the first framework that was announced by nation states. EU is also trying to do that. But I think that there's also this, this kind of scope for public policy and what governments are doing to actually foster technology and how do they govern data issues that will inevitably arise and that would be kind of the next horizon to look at. Uh, just 45 seconds left, so it's just one last question here. A quick question and a quick answer. Hi, good evening, Suri. Uh, I'm Mr. Trump from Punjab, living up in Fort Bend, and Mr. Fusion, and Nagai. My question to Mr. Narendra is that what kind of uh, growth do you anticipate in uh, India's GDP, which can really uh, overcome and you know, solve the problem of unemployment, which is a big issue uh, at the moment with the present government in coming five years? What, what is your anticipation and what do you think about it? 
Well, I, I think uh, what is realistic is a 7 to 8 percent kind of growth immediately. I think that's what Edgar is aiming for. The government itself has said you need to have growth more than 10 percent if you really want to solve uh, the issue of jobs. I don't think the issue of jobs can be created, solved by, uh, you know, industry. I think uh, it needs to go across industries, it needs to go into entrepreneurship, it needs to go into the rural economy in a big way, agriculture, agri-processing. So there are multiple areas, there's no quick solution to it. Uh, so uh, to me, unless we have at least 10% growth, I don't think you're coming anywhere close to solving the jobs problem. Thank you. Please come in. Yes. Uh, I was, uh, uh, what is the of India, if one goes into the reality of it, it is because of the technology which we have been getting from different parts of the world. And China, Americans, and the European world have given so much to China. The same thing is now in the coming five years if we get the similar flow from the world. I'm confident that with the Indian manpower and the skilled power, it can, the GDP of India will become number one in the world. We are number one, but it will grow much bigger than China, and which will help not only in India, but it will help the African continent also in the same manner. So the private-public partnership is the key solution for the whole thing. Today, we are getting people from uh, many parts of the world, they come to India, they don't know how to take off, how they can invest, what they can do, the different policies, different problems they are facing. The different, different norms they have in India has to be completely kept open and give the opportunity to investments over there, as they did in China. Of course, China was a dictator, so India is a democracy. India is a largely democracy, but we have to change now and we have to bring in more opportunities because 1.2 billion people in India, 700 million people are in, you know, in the villages. So you can imagine we have to create new India in the plan of it. And we all Indian industrials who are here today in Segovia, uh, India conference over here, the message should go to the government that we all should join hands together with private public partnership and bring more and more opportunities from the world that the technology information in should come in in the big way where we can bring new new concepts, new ideas, new thoughts and this is how India can grow in a bit. This is my message. Thank you. Uh, time is up. Uh, I, I think with this ocean of knowledge uh, sitting in this panel, uh, Frank, I think I've been given three hours to discuss this topic. Mm -hmm. But ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for this lovely panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.